Yale Podcast Network. From Yale University, this is Tech Empire. Today we have on Frank Pasquale. He received his JD in law from Yale University and is currently professor of law at the University of Maryland. He is a member of the NSF-funded Council for Big Data, Ethics, and Society, and an affiliate fellow of Yale Law School's Information Society Project. His famous book, The Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information, develops a social theory of reputation, search, and finance. Frank, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Michael. Great to be here. Okay, today we'll be talking about tech giants, education, the copyright industry, and more. Um, I want to make sure we discuss a little, some things that people might not have heard from you uh, about. Um, but before we get to that, I want to ask you, why, why this subject? How did you get into the politics of digital technology to start? So I've been really interested in a lot of the aspects of organization of information online and contesting some dominant paradigms there. And I think one of the dominant paradigms has been that the chief uh, enemy of progress online is, say, content owners who are overly aggressive um, or uh, the government as you know, a potential uh, interferer with the ways in which people communicate. I think those things are deeply problematic in many situations. But I've tried to focus for the past decade or so on the mega platforms, the now often called GAFAM, you know, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, um, that have a great deal of power over online life because of the way in which network effects work and the way in which people sort of all tend to congregate on one big platform once uh, it becomes popular. And so that's been really a big interest of mine. And it's also been trying to figure out how we regulate these things, because the dominant theme, I think, of the past few decades has been that they have tended to win legal cases on so many fronts. They've changed intellectual property law to favor them. They've changed online intermediary, intermediary library liability with respect to like CDA 230, um, other aspects of law. Um, privacy law has really sort of uh, fallen behind because these platforms are so powerful and recombining data in so many ways. And so I think all of these legal changes have been at the foundation of platform power. And my question is, how do we start to uh, rein that in and control that in the same way in which folks in the late 19th, early 20th century started developing utility law to deal with the very powerful railroads, electric companies, water companies, other entities that had uh, infrastructural power in daily life? Okay. So before we dig into the details, um, uh, you put forward this notion that we we have a, a, a black box society. Um, how would you define that? And at what point did that become a, a apparent to you? Given that there was uh, optimism about the virtues of digital technology, uh, say, extending back into the 90s and, and early 2000s. The journey to writing the Black Box Society was a long and circuitous one. And I would say that it actually, to get back to your point of optimism, my first articles were in intellectual property, and they were particularly aimed at loosening intellectual property protections to empower both consumers and platforms to gain access to knowledge. And this was pieces I did on... Um, uh, what was called Beyond Napster was about changing uh, or using antitrust law to get more access to online music. Another was on uh, copyright and the fourth fair use factor and saying that uh, there was a lot of information overload online. We needed to open up fair use to let search engines and other entities sort of organize data better. It's funny because uh, when I got to a few years after I began teaching, I went to a conference on search engines at Yale, um, or there were two. One was called Reputational Economies of Cyberspace. The other was just on search engines in general. And I just found myself very wary about the types of optimism that was very common then because I was already seeing at that time some real problems that were happening online with respect to the ways in which people's reputations were being shaped 
by search engines, you know, and the, the people didn't have control over them. So very negative uh, and even untrue information could be the first search engine result in people's names. And from a very early uh, time, entities like Google would say, well, not our problem. You know, we're just, you know, not really our problem. And, and it's for so many things that's been their attitude, not our problem. And and part of what I wanted to do is to increase responsibility. But, and to, to make a long story short, because I could tell the story very long, but just to just telescope it a bit, as I was writing about the intermediaries, the financial crisis of 2008 happened, and I just got fascinated with them. And the whole uh, message of that book, of the Black Box book, is that so many of the digital methods of organizing and storing information are similar between Wall Street and Silicon Valley, between tech firms and finance firms. And that similarity is something that really drives my research to this day, particularly the types of pressure that financialization puts on big platforms to essentially try to evade law and to um, squeeze more uh, surplus value out of different entities whose uh, materials are used and organized uh, on the platform. Okay, so let's then um, let's talk a little bit about uh, social credit scores, right? Um, uh, people are now talking a lot about China. It's been around for a bit, but um, you know this notion of, of kind of giving a character ranking on the basis of, of a lot of sources of data uh, about their citizens and having there be uh, societal benefits, right, on, on the basis of that. There was the first episode of Black Mirror in season three, I think it was, um, that kind of jarred a lot of people about this. Um, what, what do you see in the United States space in this term, in, in this, uh, uh, um, you know, area? It, we know that, for example, uh, Facebook has a patent on being able to evaluate people on the basis of who their friends are, right? Um, these kinds of, of, of ratings and rankings of people, um, are they usable right now? Are they being used right now? And uh, should be people... How should people be receiving this? So there's a lot of discourse going on now about the uh, social credit scoring system and about parallel potential and what might actually might be actual uh, social credit scoring in other countries. And I say might be actual because a big theme of my black box book is that we have no idea what's going on in any of these firms. The uh, types of accountability and auditing that would be necessary for us to truly understand the nature of their operations are... Uh, light years away in policy uh, terms. So to go back to the plans for uh, Chinese social credit scoring and the article uh, written by Myra Hirstedeval in Wired a few months ago and you know, some other things that have been online, what they describe is a really diabolically uh, contrived system of social control. And you know, I think sometimes where, whereby uh, you are scored on all manner of social interactions, um, creditworthiness, uh, loyalty to the, to the regime. But not only are you scored, your friends and family are scored. But not only are your friends and family scored, their score can affect your score and vice versa. And finally, and this is what I think is the true genius of it, all of that is supposedly transparent to everyone else. Okay? And so this is something that like Deleuze in his societies of control, even he didn't think of something that was such a perfect mechanism of control whereby people will be feel a lot of pressure in uh, you know not merely to preserve and protect their own score but to know all the social pressure involved in punishing them and those they love for deviation from whatever behavior is expected by authorities so I think that this is to me this is one of the chief if not the chief privacy problem in the world today um, and I know that might seem overstated. I know that many people in the privacy community have said, oh, don't worry, you know, the Sesame credit score that's often reported as the social credit score is not actually as powerful and pervasive as it's made out to be. And it's, it, you know, there are forms of resistance potential, et cetera. I don't think that's right. I think that this is actually about what Phil Agar, um, a, a great surveillance scholar, his name is spelled A-G-R-E, described as capture. And in some of his work on surveillance and capture, he described how um, these types of interventions could would not merely be about external social control, but they would also be about changing the souls and desires of people in general. 
and we can connect that to the surveillance surveillance and society crowd that David Murakami Wood has contributed to. We can connect that to um, other uh, work um, with respect to um, uh, disciplining and modulation by Julie Cohen. And I think when you look at the just the broad scheme of critical social theory about surveillance as a mode of social control, it is very hard not to be chilled or to find uh, this uh, uh, social credit scoring system chilling and to see exactly how it will chill behavior in the future. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's think about something concrete, right? Um, let's say your credit worthiness. Let's say banks could look at or derive a credit score on the basis of who your Facebook friends are or whether or not you have a Facebook account. Um, what are the rules and regulations on that right now? Is this in – what's kind of the, uh, the, the latest on that? Well, one of the things with respect to the underwriting rules and regulations now is I, – I, sh- I should press this by saying – this is not something I have written directly on for about four or five years. So I, I cannot hold myself out as the expert on the application of um, what's called fringe or alternative data in this context. But let me start with that definitional issue, and then we can get into what laws might be relevant here. Definitionally, the group Upturn has very helpfully categorized the types of information that are often used in credit scoring systems in the U.S., and before I go into the U.S., I should also just mention that there's a book by Nicola Gentsch uh, called Comparative Financial Privacy that looks at the credit scoring systems around the world. And it's fascinating to compare how some countries essentially nationalize a function that has been privatized in the U.S. Uh, to our great detriment, I believe, given the complete failure of security at a place like Equifax and the complete inability of the government to take responsibility for properly investigating that um, that we've been seeing under the Trump administration. But to come back to the upturn report about the nature of the data involved, if we look at the data that is involved in uh, potential credit scoring systems, the core data would be things like payment history. And what's so fascinating here is that payment history in nearly any scheme is 85% determinative of the person's future uh, uh, credit worthiness. It's just a very dominant factor in terms of being able to predict whether someone's going to be credit worthy or not. But then we can go beyond that to add additional data to call it alternative data. That data has increasingly been going into um, scoring systems, and some of that data might include things like your utility bills, right? So it's not just like your credit score, your repayment history on credit itself in a mortgage, student loan, car loan, title loan, uh, other loan context. But this alternative data goes beyond to, you know, how often do do you ever miss your utility bills or other things like that? Now, the fringe data, which is what we're concerned about here particularly, would be things like, how do you use Facebook? Do you go on late at night and write multiple messages with multiple exclamation points uh, to people you don't know? Um, Or do you always use proper punctuation and grammar and get your comments liked by the people that you comment on? Okay. You can imagine that that's, there's a just-so story whereby the first uh, behavior could be seen as extremely uh, uh, bad or problematic uh, or a, a warning sign, and the latter would be seen as exemplary and as uh, correlated with uh, good creditworthiness. Now, to the extent that companies are doing using this data, my understanding is that this type of fringe data is mainly used outside the U.S., particularly in areas where there is not good data underlying for you know a large swath of the population. So we're talking about in Africa, there's, uh, for example, a lot of underwriting based on uh, mobile phone usage. Um, and by the way, that could go into things like, uh, is someone in bed by 9 or 10 o'clock each night, or do they seem to you know carouse late into the night or something like that, or how they type text? One of the examples was um, they found that if you call your mom, yes, then that was actually predictive of whether or not you're credit worthy for a small loan. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's, that's a very interesting. Right. Well, okay. Well, now this is yeah. something I can get behind as we're coming up on Mother's Day in a few months. But no, <laughs> but you know, I think that's right. So you know, to get into this, the, ultimately the laws here. The ultimate thing that you're going to have to watch out for if you're using this stuff is disparate impact on minority groups. And so that's the thing. And that's one thing that I think, you know, it's not just about intent because we know all these companies are going to be going to say, oh, we don't intend to discriminate against anybody. It's just a, a matter of uh, correlating behavior to past patterns of repayment. 
But if it, if despite any sort of neutral or blank or intent, if there is clear disparate impact, that I believe will be seen as problematic um, and could lead to lawsuits. And there's a particular uh, area where I think the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau put out a guidance with respect to underwriting based on cohort default rate in the student loan co- refinancing context. And so that could like cramp the style of entities like SoFi or others that might be using uh, fringe data to um, decide who to offer uh, refis to and how low to uh, make that refi offer. But now we see this kind of spreading, right? So we can think of this in a lot of domains of life, not just your creditworthiness. We can think of it in um, applying for a job and your employer sifting through applications, um, health insurance, potentially university applications, right? Um, now, the question I have here is uh, if there's certain variables that are predictive, right? If you're going to apply into a university, it may be highly predictive whether or not your parents um, also have some sort of higher education, right? So that can also then wind up becoming, like you said, having a disparate impact on minorities or marginalized communities. Um, And it's really kind of not fair also because it's your parents. Um, But there's also other forms of data that are um, extremely innocuous, right? So like you were saying, um, maybe do you use exclamation points? Um, Do you swear a lot, right? And if we find in big data sets that uh, through big, big data analysis that uh, there's correlations here, what is the limitation on an employer, a health insurance agency, potentially a university, from rolling together all this data, creating a score for you, and then that's that's what now decides whether or not you're even considered for a job or a university um, or what your health insurance is. These are great possibilities, and I think to really think them through, we have to step back a bit from the immediate examples that, that you gave and to think about the nature of decision-making in many key contexts. And for this answer, I'm going to draw from two works that I've published over the... One is called Reputation Regulation. It's a 2008 article. Uh, it's up on the web. Um, people can find it. And, and the, the, the other is a piece with Daniel Citron called The Scored Society, which was about all these different scoring systems that are out there. There are now at least, there are thousands of scoring systems out there in various contexts along the lines that you've described. And I think that what the key problem here is, and this is going to get into some key issues with the GDPR and the right to explanation of profiling as well. The key problem is that for decades our background understanding of the types of decisions that were made by key decision makers like banks, employers, landlords, um, insurers, others, that there was something quasi-juridical about these decisions. And I see the quasi-juridical in the sense that they are not merely ways in which those entities maximize profits or extraction from the economy as a whole, but also that for us to accept the power of those entities to be legitimate, we had to be assured that the decision was actually made with some reference to the factors that are under the control of the individual who was uh, being judged. And I want to give a really good concrete example to come back to the concrete to show how important this is and to show how that sense got eroded and why we now may be needing, desperately needing to build it back up. The example is that after Hurricane Katrina, uh, there was legislation in Congress, I believe, that was proposed that would prevent credit scoring companies to take to penalize people in the New Orleans region for late payment of bills for, I think, three to six months after Katrina, recognizing the degree of disruption these people's lives had undergone. And I think the Democrats had put that forward and then, you know, basically captured by the industry lobbyists and or perhaps ideologically, um, a lot of Republicans, perhaps even some Democrats said, nope, you know, if, too bad if you get hit by a hurricane, if you, you know, if you have 11 feet of water in your living room uh, and you're effectively homeless and uh, penniless, you should still be paying your bills. Uh, 
Okay. Um, and But they didn't frame it that way, right? And the way they would frame it, and this draws on the history that Martha Poon has done on the nature of credit scoring, is they would just say, well, this is a science. It's not about judging you personally. It's just business. And we are just treating the way we would analyze a rock or a stone or a tree. We're analyzing you as a uh, entity with some physical regularities in its behavior. And that's what we're going to do. And we're not going to like try to add uh, any moral judgment. It's just business. So I think to come back to your original question, the problem is that the big problem with these systems is that they are treating human beings like things. And that as long as we have this positivist mentality that is drained of moral uh, uh, considerations, driving the use of big data in the economy, we're going to continue to see, I think, intent, more entrenched social stratification. Um, rather than the types of promise of opportunity that is so often accompanying the deployment of these digital technologies. Or I shouldn't say accompanying, so often marketed as the promise of these digital technologies. Uh, What do you say to um, these practices? Because these seem to be fundamental to me, right? Um, When you look at uh, Julia Angwin and others' um, story on algorithmic bias uh, in the criminal justice system, and they assigned risk scores. uh, And then they went through the data by race, and they found that the risk scores were uh, designating black people at a criminal risk at twice as high as their white counterparts. But then after some time had elapsed, they didn't actually go on to commit crimes at a different rate. Um, That Part of what they, the company said in response is, well, we're looking at things like job history or employment or whatever because those, our predictive value goes down if we don't have those factors in. But we all know that if you have class overlapping with race and overlapping with other factors, that a lot of times those things are going to the, – the predicted actor, accuracy is going to go down if you don't include those – those things in there. So is there a way out of this? Well, you know, I think that here's the trade-off. I think that the the question of predictive accuracy is, to me, uh, a bit of a red herring. It's not everything, okay? And to give another example and to talk about the quasi-juridical nature of these determinations, in the legal system, the trial and legal processes generally do not put truth above all other values, right? We could, for example, um, put video cameras in everybody's houses, and we would never have, say, a contested domestic abuse case because we'd have the video evidence. We'd know exactly what had gone on in that case. We could uh, get rid of the spousal privilege, and we could say, "Look, you know, sorry, but if you've got a, uh, if your spouse did something wrong, you've got to testify in court against that person." We could get rid of a lot of the hearsay rules. We could just say, well, you know, in general, like these types of learned treatises are fine. And so, you know, FRE 808, Section 13 or whatever it is with respect to learned treatises, that's not a we let's let's change that. Okay, with respect to how we uh, administer that. And, you know, instead, and and I draw this from an article by uh, Fred Bloom called Information Lost and Found. Instead, what we do in the legal system is we balance various societal values, right? And I talk about one, for example, in my book, um, the value of subsequent remedial measures evidence in tort cases. So, for example, let's say somebody goes down a staircase without a rail, they fall over it and get a broken arm and they sue the person who didn't have a rail. If the person with the staircase puts a rail back on the staircase or puts, puts a rail on that staircase after they've been sued, the entity, the person who fell over when it was not there, cannot go to court and say, look, it's evidence. Now we know, you know, they put this, they did this uh, safety measure. It should have been done all along. That's what's known as a subsequent remedial measure. And in general, that evidence is not allowed in as, say, evidence about the nature of uh, what the obligation or the duty of care should have been with respect to that staircase. So I would go with respect to these uh, examples you've given and say that you know the system of ranking and rating people for credit or other opportunities is not one where the overriding, where the only, or I would say even the overriding social value is 
maximizing repayment or um, trying to ensure maximum profitability for the companies involved, right? And you might say, oh, well, repayment, I mean, that seems really important, not just to the company, but the person uh, involved, right? But on the other hand, that uh, type of metric is itself dependent on the nature of bankruptcy law and how we treat failures to repay. <laughs> you know, we could be a lot more forgiving in many contexts than we are now. So I think in general, the the, the situation here is one where the uh, tunnel vision focus on a metric, what Jerry Muller calls the tyranny of metrics, has distracted us from the social nature of the determinations involved. And what we need to do as a society is to start developing a richer sense of the purposes and goals of these determinations, rather than being rushed into reducing them to one metric. And, and by the way, this whole critique ties into Doug Kaiser's and Lisa Heiselings and Frank Ackerman's critiques of cost-benefit analysis, right? I mean, you know, this is this is part of a much broader set of considerations where you have all too often folks with mathematical training, quantitative training, who are effectively um, put, driving out what used to be much, I think, richer uh, conversations and trying to replace them with a number. And part of my role here is to push back against the idea that these uh, uh, numerical or narrow uh, quantifications methods are the be-all and end-all in these spheres. Yeah. And I mean, to me, some of this seems to be a, a little bit of common sense in looking at the big picture, right? Um, obviously, people come back with the counter argument. They say, look, humans are biased too. Humans are black boxes. We don't know why they decide to hire this person and not that that other one. Um, but at the same time, we know that the the sheer amount of data that's being collected about people is um, – it's kind of controversial, right? And and also that uh, from a certain perspective, um, how is this going to impact as time goes on people's psyches? Um, one – one of the things that's happening now is uh, they're extending big data down into the education system, and they want to use artificial intelligence uh, software to personalize uh, learning for children. And the idea there is that a class, uh, uh, if you have a full 30 kids in a class, e the teacher can't really get to know each student, and each student actually is really different, Right. And so if we have an artificial intelligence system that collects a continuous stream of data about children, then and then we run analytics on them, especially cross-referencing their behaviors, their performance against a cohort of millions of people, we can begin to have the machines evaluate them and give them that personalized attention that a teacher in a classroom can't. Right, but the trade-off here is all of this data is being collected um, about the students, and now we're looking at children, right, being intensively data mined from the time they're potentially six years old. Um, what do you think about extending these kinds of systems down into the education system? I'm very worried about it because I believe that there needs there needs to be a right to be unjudged in certain parts of life that I would root in the Irving Goffman's concept of uh, being on stage or off stage, right? It's very critical to people that there are moments when they can be off stage, when they can, you know, what they're saying, for example, about their boss is not necessarily going to be heard by the boss or otherwise uh, have the boss be privy to it. And frankly, what they're saying about their family will not necessarily be at work, will not necessarily be um, sort of something that their family can look up or think about later, <laughs> you know, that you need to be able to have just zones that are disconnected. And I think it's also, I would root it in the work of Michael Walzer uh, in Spheres of Justice, where he talked about how we need different spheres of society where the concepts and standards of excellence are totally different uh, in, for example, politics, economics, social life, um, athletics, um, you know, the hobbies, uh, spiritual life, all these sort of things that, that are different that should not all be connected into some agglomerative uh, data about an individual. 
I think with respect to the schooling context, I mean, you know, there's a couple of directions I guess I would have to go in that, though, which is, I mean, I've, I've already written a chapter for a book I'm doing called Laws of Robotics on Potential Automation of Schooling. I do think there's going to be a lot of pressure to increase uh, personalized learning and data-driven education. So I want to be sure to mark out the fact that this could be very helpful in terms of uh, particularly allowing people that don't have access to um, really good teachers to get some access to automated versions of them, or it could be very good for individuals who are, say, outliers, either you know being way ahead of their class or way behind, either catch up or to do enrichment learning. That's all very helpful. But I also think we just need to be able to guard that data and to give children and parents the right to uh, delete it at some point. You know, and that I think is uh, that sort of right of digital self-determination is a constant theme of Audrey Waters' work, and I hope it becomes a bigger part of the uh, the agenda here. Now, if if you have this kind of you know right to delete the data, right? Um, I think it's something that's desirable, and I think it's something that everybody would like to see in many domains, right? Um, uh, at the same time, uh, part of part of Putting this into the school system, um, I mean, what does it mean if your kids are inside of a uh, being given homework and there's a learner management system that they have to log into and it's run off the cloud so there's real no option for the data not to be collected about them? I mean, maybe they cannot have a persistent profile uh, about them, but at the same time, they're still being asked to be uh, to to be using this as as a part of their homework, and they can't not do their homework if it's in the, these systems, right? And that would that would include, say, Google, right? And we're not just talking about Newton and, and Pearson and, and some of the you know AI based um, education specific software, um, but what do you do if you don't like you don't want to be using Google Docs and Google, I have a Google account, and you're a Google Classroom school. And your homework is is asking you to log into the Google system and to do it on the cloud. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's a real problem, you know, and I think that this is the, and, you know, you raise a very interesting point in terms of what would practical alternatives look like. If we look, for example, at the concern about Microsoft Internet Explorer, um, what the European Commission ultimately did is they said, oh, well, there needs to be a browser ballot, right? So you can't have Microsoft just tying into its operating system one particular browser. You have to give people the opportunity to see, to try various different browsers. And I think that that could be a principle here, that you would say that people should be able to use multiple systems and then you'd force interoperability between them. The only worry that I would have about that is I think the interoperability in the health records context has been quite uh, elusive in many areas, in part because the Obama administration's Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology did not try to force it. They just you know, gave these reports on information blocking and try to nudge it along, but it really didn't work. Um, and so I think that, you know, you're, this is a really cutting edge issue, and I hope that you'll pursue it in terms of trying to force from the get-go interoperability among systems so that there are, people have choice, and with that choice, there could be competition for better privacy policies. Now, um, in terms of, uh, Tech in schools, right? Um, part of this story also seems to be that um, it's a good opportunity for Google, Apple, and Microsoft especially, right, to get their products in the schools and to capture consumers from childhood. Um, what do you think, you know, I mean, we, we know that we do have uh, software like GNU Linux and and um, other options, right, that aren't these, um, you know, it's not an advertising company or a proprietary software company that is putting its product in your school system. Um, do you think that that this is something that is kind of a, uh, a, a grab in terms of the market for the big tech giants? 
Yes, I think that you know there's a real uh, land. There's a gold rush mentality. There's an effort to just sort of come in and take over. You know, to sort of have some lost leaders and lose some money at the beginning, but then eventually become what people are locked into. You've seen that even with respect to um, LMSs, learning management systems like Blackboard. I mean, I've been teaching for almost 15 years, and I'm still using the. Same relatively bulky software from Blackboard, in part because of the path dependence um, uh, aspect of software choices. So clearly, that's part of the problem, you know. And I think sort of tying path dependence to the issue of privacy is a really smart one. And we're going to need to have that type if if we're going to have competition at all. I would say though that you know my ultimate hope is that you get. Uh, substantive use regulation, you know, that that will lower the temperature here and make it a little bit more, um, uh, make things a little bit less, put a little bit less pressure on people to make the right choices all the time. But overall, though, uh, you are right to say that there probably needs to be uh, a lot more from the get-go, ab initio uh, regulation of the number of options that are available for individuals. Yes, I agree with that. No, in terms of um, of education, um, we know that uh, in places, especially places where I, I've done my research uh, in South Africa, and I started my research off looking at uh, access to knowledge and copyright, and uh, the idea here was uh, uh, they had a crisis of textbook delivery in Limpopo, and that's and then they started looking at the potential for tablets to be a mechanism to just bypass having to print physical textbooks and get them into the schools. And the idea would be, well, there's more information, right? It's, it's um, you know, especially if you can hook up to the internet. Um, and, you know, so there was this access to knowledge issue here. And one of the things about copyright, right, is that um, we're now moving or, or have – already partially moved into a, a situation in which information, uh, published works are increasingly cheap, right, in terms of cost to reproduce. Um, we can copy and paste massive amounts of information, increasingly so as time goes on, and then everybody can get access to information that's been published. Um, so when I was looking at that in South Africa, I said, well... Uh, and, and I know some others, uh, Eben Moglin and, and, and Richard Stallman, um, you know, have been saying copyright, w and because of the change in technology, there's a good reason to allow people to share published works freely in, in, in the interest of, of equity, right, or equality and, and uh, social justice. Um, what do you think about copyright um, as, as we move forward uh, from, from the perspective of poverty, you know, access to knowledge for those who are too poor to pay for for published work. Well, I have I have a pretty complex take on this, and I think that you know I'm going to start with the global political economy angle, and then back up into an angle with respect to um, the access to knowledge movement. In general, and then also sort of the internet freedom uh, types of movements within uh, the more developed world. So to start with the role of intellectual property in the global political economy, I do think that there is a very strong case that, you know, if you look at a country like, if you look at the work of Ha Jun Chang, like in his 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism or some of his earlier books, he is very compelling in terms of describing his childhood in Korea and just and explaining that, you know, if he had not, if his family and those around him had not pirated a lot of works, uh, he just wouldn't have had access to vital knowledge he needed for his career. And many, many people there would not. And he points out that the United States was a classic copyright breaker in the 19th century, that, you know, the, the books from England would come over here and America would just copy indiscriminately. And of course, now it appears that America is uh, pulling up the ladder with respect to other uh, com countries that are now developing in terms of trying to push very expansive uh, intellectual property protections. In the 19th century, they didn't uh, legally, they didn't observe foreign copyrights. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, right. that's, that's exactly and, right. And, yeah. and the idea was they didn't have, well, part of this was that they didn't have quite as developed an intellectual culture and they val highly valued foreign works from Europe. 
right? And is the they developed their own um, American culture intellectuals. Then it, it, the the power changed, uh, or the desire to have um, their works exported potentially, and, and to protect against um, you know foreign competition. So it's, it's kind of a, a you know, power politics, right? It is, yes. So that's that's very important. And I want to be sure to recognize that and to recognize the importance of the international access to justice movement or access to knowledge movement. However, here's my contrarian take. I also believe that, I think that, you know, for the 90s, the t- early 2000s, the big push was how do we get as much intellectual property to people that can't afford it for free, or for near free, right? I think the push has been since the mid-2000s onward, and I think accelerating now as we see the collapse of, of many journalistic enterprises and many similar enterprises, the question becomes, how do you assure some level of fair payment to those who create uh, intellectual work, right? And for example, you know, I very harshly reviewed a book called The End of College by Kevin Carey, uh, because essentially his his idea was, look, why do we even need colleges? Why don't we just have one biology course for the whole world, you know, or one contracts course? And then, you know, you make it like a movie. You invest $10 million, but you have 100 million people see it. And so basically, you know, it's just 10 cents a piece or something like that. Um, and to me, that is fundamentally naive on a number of levels, one being that the nature of power, there's a lot of nature of power in knowledge and distributing that power is a good thing in many respects. It's good that we have many, many different types of law and humanities and social science courses out there. Um, With respect to biology, my answer would be, you know, it's good that we have people that are professors of biology that are spread around and that that distributed, that expertise is distributed. And so to, we've got to bring into, I think the access to knowledge conversation a sense of equitable and sustainable financing for the human personnel necessary to generate, revise, protect, update, maintain, disseminate knowledge, right? Right. And that's very, and, and that was something, by the way, I noticed in your article about the South African Fakiza project, where you were talking about the potential uh, undermining or corrosion of the terms of employment of uh, teachers. That's got to be part of the conversation too. So yeah, that's that's a very important part of the conversation. Yeah, and and I mean, from what I've looked into, um, there's enough money. To, the content industries are, are are powerful in terms of lobbying, but the amount of revenue they generate isn't that high. If you're looking at film, music, uh, books, uh, video games, right? I mean, we're comparing, let's say, to trillions of dollars spent on war. <laughs> um, oh yeah. The right, so like it's not like it's not doable, you know. And I know you you have mentioned in your book Dean Baker and in in you know voucher um, solutions and, and and things like that, right? Um, but there's a, a second issue to the copyright conversation that um, you know is is interesting here, and, and you had touched upon it, um, and that is uh, having alternatives, but not wanting to have surveillance be a a part of it, and also the aggressiveness of trying to contain piracy using surveillance. Um, now, we we know that that downloading seems to have um, given way partially to to pirate streaming, but we also know that technology is continuing to develop in ways that are still potentially threatening to the industry. So if we're looking now, let's say, five years, ten years from now, and we have 50 terabyte hard drives out on the market that are affordable for many people, or um, and we have ultra-high-speed internet, what do you do when I can send somebody in an afternoon all of the music that was published in the 60s or all of the, you know, top hits that were in the last decade, right? I mean, at some point, they're still going to have to deal with the fact that there's a a, a dispersal. Now, you have mentioned that it's, it's, it's potential that the state is going to have to get involved, right? But there are potentially other options. Um, So for example, what if we just don't have hard drives in our devices anymore? 
and all data is stored in the cloud, right? Um, which would be surveillance, but it, it could potentially just be exclusively or almost exclusively in the corporate sector. And then they have some sort of authentication to determine that you're using your device and you have the right to access content and then you're just like renting it basically. Um, do you think that there is a, a pending crisis still that we're in kind of a um, – the eye of a storm almost with the copyright industry and that moving forward in time as technology gets more advanced and potentially dispersed and powerful in the hands of, of, of the people or not, that there's going to – that the logic of this is being pushed towards a head where it's either going to be some sort of surveillance or excessive control regime or information in published works are just going to be spread pretty freely. Well, I think that, you know, that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, the ultimate goal here, I mean, I, I remember back even in the 90s, there was the dichotomy between info anarchy and perfect control. And the idea was that you would either see the technology online develop to the point where it would perfectly control all manner of dis dissemination of copyright works, or there would be total anarchy and nobody could control anything. Uh, this sort of vision that John Perry Barlow put forward in his uh, Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. And I think that you know the, the future is going to be messier than that. I would not necessarily sign on to some sort of like centralized uh, repository, although I think that you know someone like Jaron Wynne, it seems like that's the upshot of a book like of Who Owns the Future, right? That you'd have this sort of centralized one file, and then every time you access it, you'd pay some toll, perhaps very small, you know, for uh, or there would be some data kept as to what was most accessed and what was most what was not. I think that instead, the future is probably going to be something closer to what we see in education. I mean, I think that what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to look at how are sustainable communities of knowledge developed, maintained over time. And I think that, you're, you know, the, the work by Madison, Frischman, and Strandberg on commons and sustainable commons in uh, intellectual activity, that's one angle here. Um, and they just look at different communities and how they sustain the, the, their knowledge. And that's going to be a big part of it, I think. It's going to be, but all of it, I think, is going to involve either more state intervention or more professional organizations capable of uh, demanding fair compensation uh, for the type of labor they put in to create uh, forms of knowledge. What do you think the role is of, of, of the public um, in, in this conversation and some of these other conversations? Um, you know, you, you, you want to see... You say in your book you want to see an, in, an intelligible society, and that requires education to understand how the society works. And then when you're going through the finance industry and what happened in the crisis, and when you're going through you know these you know black box companies that are um, controlling data flows, it's very complex uh, uh, how it works. The solutions are potentially complex. Um, but at, this, at the same time, it seems like the, the grassroots – I mean we have the, the net neutrality campaign, right? Um, do we need more involvement from the grassroots and, and, and should there be a kind of move to try to move beyond net neutrality as a big issue for tech? And if so, you know, what would that be? So I'll divide that into two. Um, the first being the question about the having an educated public in an era of increasingly complex uh, technology. And the second being uh, beyond net neutrality. With, and I'll start with the second because it's a little easier. When I look at the broadband landscape in the United States, I mean, it really is cause for despair because there's a lot of people that are not getting adequate service and there's not really much incentive to compete on the high end either. And I think the only way to get around that is to look at the work of the Berkman Klein Center on mesh networks, on community-owned community broadband, like what you see in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and to really push hard for that. That is an area where you're going to have to see, though, leadership on the federal level, essentially, to preempt states that are in turn preempting municipalities from developing these types of uh, networks. So I'm hoping that we can see that uh, coming up, if not in this administration, clearly, although uh, uh, it looks like there's a corruption investigation of Ajit Pai going on right now, which should be interesting, but whoever is replaced by, whoever replaces him, I mean, I don't think they're going to change their policy much on this stuff. 
I think in 21 states, the state prevents municipalities from doing this. It's just banned by state law, thanks to the unitary nature of state government. But I really have a lot of hope for community broadband in these other areas, which in turn, you know, sort of ties in a little bit to the question of education in a complex society. I think there, the key thing is that um, we've got to look at a lot of different governance models around the world. And I teach administrative law. Part of administrative law is Peter Schuck's classic trichotomy between law, science, and politics. And we have to have um, trusted, scientific, dare I say it, technocratic voices in areas like privacy, data policy, et cetera, who are adequately funded, adequately financed at agencies like the Federal Trade Commission, at state attorney general's offices to do this work. And just to be, you know, go a little Walter Mitty and to, uh, you know, go into a bit of my uh, very unlikely, but, you know, still hoped for outcome of an increase in automation and a decrease of many forms of jobs and an increase in, say, an, an educated public. I think there really is a lot of room for there to be much more investment in governmental entities that are capable of regulating the digital economy on behalf of consumers. And we should see a lot of more, more folks there and a lot more resources there. I personally think the Federal Trade Commission's budget could be 10 times what it is, and they still wouldn't be doing an adequate job um, with respect to going after all of the uh, ways in which consumers are hurt by uh, especially large corporations, but even small ones around the country. And I, I would say the same about activist attorney generals, many activist attorney general's offices um, in these areas. So that would be sort of a start in terms of thinking about, you know, what's the role of the public? I mean, I don't think that the, and, and by the way, I'm a little bit bearish on, you know, solutions that require people to have intimate knowledge of encryption, to compare privacy policies, to shop for privacy, for those sorts of things. I think life is just too busy for a lot of that. Um, it's the same type of, yeah. So that would be my worry. Yeah. I mean, you you could you could say that, right? And and I I can relate to that. Part of that is that certain things are, um, I mean, re regulation can come in there and help, but that regulation might um, be a really strong like regulation that would be hard, you know, opposed pretty strongly by um, those with money and power. Um, what I have in mind here is uh, say. Installing something like Lineage OS on your phone, it's not easy in a lot of cases. You can find – you have to get your model. Then you can find guides online, but then something might go wrong, right? And for a lot of common people, it winds up becoming a headache. But that's partly because of the deals that are being struck with hardware manufacturers and you know, rules that allow um, you know, companies to get away with – um, having it be against the law to not be able to jailbreak your phone or to have some sort of um, you know detection as to whether or not you've been authenticated to install a, an alternative operating system on your phone when you turn it on, right? So I think some of those those tech solutions are sometimes complex because it, it's 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 not it doesn't have to be that way, right? Like obviously we need to have um, some things that are um, in place as alternatives, and they need to be accessible for the the um, common person. Um, but in terms of of, of regulations um, and and the kind of deep problems that we have, uh, I mean, what do you make of the fact that the 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 companies that are in charge, like for example, there's a lot of talk right now, right, about the the tech giants and what do we do? I mean, they're kind of this new gilded age with these, you know, big corporations here, and there's a handful of them, right? I think you said Gatham, right? And, you know, but if we just, uh, what's the solution here? Is it to is it to break them up? Will we be left with a lot of just a handful of like small monsters, right? Like, I mean, how do you how do you get out of the situation of this crazy centralization of the services when going back to what we started off talking about? We were hoping to have an internet and an experience in which people can, without intermediaries controlling them, governments or private sector, um, you know, have direct collaboration and, and communication with each other without censorship. Um, how do we deal with the, you know, regulating the, the tech giants in, in this way? 
Well, I'm sorry, this will have to be my last or probably second to last answer. <laughs> but I, I will just say that with respect to the regulation, that we really need to follow the example that you, there, we, we need to look for global leaders with respect to regulation. And I think that Europe is doing a great deal here in trying to make sure that there is a level playing field across the board with respect to privacy, competition policy, taxation, consumer protection. You need to have an integrated set of priorities on all four of those fronts in order to really make a dent in platform power. If you do that, I think that also creates the conditions for competition to emerge. If you don't, if you have a society like the US, where essentially it's devil take the hindmost, where you know the, the, the sharpest imaginable business practices uh, are common among, say, an entity like Uber, um, where when it is caught doing something bad, it's just a slap on the wrist, they pay the fine, they move on. That message that the U.S. policymakers are sending is essentially the sky's the limit for the entity that acts the most unethically. And so, you know, to me, it's 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 kind of an easy dichotomy sometimes when I, uh, you know, going to places like Canada, Asia, other places where I've I've spoken on some of these issues because it's just like you know try to avoid what the U.S. is doing and try to follow what a lot of what Europe is doing. And I know that sounds simplistic, but you know it's funny because even in health policy, they, uh, Taiwan in the '90s had to develop a national health system, and they asked some of the people there, "What was your guiding principle? You studied systems around the world." And they said, "Well, the first thing we want to do is just avoid what America's doing." <laughs> you know, so I I think this is a, scenario, a situation yeah. where you really have to um, uh, begin look at it with a combined, coherent, comprehensive view where all of the policymakers and the care areas are talking to each other. And I think you see that in Europe. I think the people in the different directorate, directorates general in the European Commission are talking to each other. They have a common sense of the magnitude of the problem. I see nothing like that in the United States right now, and, and it really is tragic. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. Absolutely. No, it's absolutely great to be on. All right, and I look forward to your your book when uh, when that's coming out. Let's hope late twenty nineteen. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thank okay. you. <laughs>